yeah so that's it hello um my name's ali cameron hello i'm sheila duffy and we are um presenting today um a talk called when the ice goes the river flows an introduction to the mesolithic d side project um we recorded this in April 2020, obviously in lockdown, and so we wanted to share our project with um, a few more people and so hopefully enjoy this very um, short introductory mm -hmm. talk. Um, for those of you who don't know, Mesolithic Scotland essentially dates from around 4,000 to 8,500 BC. And um, but we have evidence actually from a little earlier than that, which we'll talk about uh, in a little while. And at this time, um, just after the ice left Scotland, we were essentially um, hunter gatherers traveling around the sort of coastal and riverine areas um, through woodland, which Scotland was more covered in. Um, and there were great fluctuations in temperature and rainfall um, at this time. And the sea level was lower, so um, there was a land bridge to Europe during the um, these early periods. And this is a plan just showing you well where the Dee is for a start. So if you not, don't live in the area, um, you can see the River Dee uh, coming in here, northeast of Scotland um, and running in. You can see where the ice sheet was. And I've just put Doggerland on here. Some of you will have heard of Doggerland, which has been quite well publicised. Um, and it's an area which, of course, used to be land and is now under the North Sea. Mesolithic period in and around the Dee um, has been studied in the past by uh, people like James Kenworthy. He um, did an excavation at this amazing site uh, at Nether Mills in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Uh, and he found something like um, 40,000 lithics altogether. And um, he found some features which show in this plan sort of these circular areas with stones and various different um, things which he thought were halves and possibly post holes. Um, the site has actually been restudied by Karen, Caroline Wickham Jones recently, and she felt that maybe there wasn't enough evidence for a structure here, but certainly there was. this was a, a, a very large Mesolithic site, um, and we'll show you a little bit more about that later. We've been doing some test fitting there with the University of Aberdeen. This site was amazing. All of these little tiny lithics, a lot of which were being recovered from wet sieving, now, um, today, to our modern eye, this might look a little dangerous, adults and children pottering around next to this quite fast flowing river. Um, but um, I don't think anybody was lost at all. And the um, this process recovered enormous amounts of tiny little flints that would not necessarily have been seen, you know, during the excavation. And this is a picture of some of the flints that were found. And again, we're going to talk a little bit about more about the types of flints. But you can see various tools here, blades, um, knives, cores here, and um, you know a very, very large range of really lovely mesolithic finds from the site. This is just a couple of uh, images showing these lovely little points and blades um, and how sharp flint is even after all of this time. These little lithics um, that were found in, uh, in large numbers at uh, Nether Mill um, were often hafted onto um, wood or uh, antler. And you can see here one that was found in Sweden a number of years ago. And this is hazel wood, uh, which has had four of these microliths, as they're called, attached onto them. And they would be attached in with a resin, which you can see is surviving. Obviously, these um, uh, do not, not survive really well here. But um, Mesolithic D side are hoping one day to be able to excavate one of these fantastic um, objects. And you can hear, see here some modern hafting um, using different materials, resin, and um, strapping on with um, textile or um, gut from an animal. There's another wonderful site um, up in D side at Crathis. And this is if you go into the uh, entrance into Crathis Castle. And on the right hand side, um, there's a field called Warren Field. And in it, there is a Neolithic, this is an aerial photograph. This is, there is a Neolithic structure here, this amazing Neolithic building, which was excavated by Charlie and Hilary Murray. But another site, which was reported by aerial photographs, are these um, line of pits here, which um, were excavated in the uh, 2004 to 5. 
this was the team. This is Shannon Fraser, who was the National Trust archaeologist for this area, and some of her volunteers on the site marking out these pits. And when they were excavated, they were very deep. Um, uh, to get to the bottom of them was quite a depth. And you can see here um, a soil specialist who's looking at the sections of the pits. And essentially what um, they, they were originally cut in the Mesolithic, and you can see lots of buildup of different um, layers here, gravels, essentially. But uh, they were all recut in the Neolithic here. Uh, and so it suggests that each of the pits you could still see on the ground over several uh, centuries, um, sorry, um, millennia later, you could see that the pits were still there and they were recut in the centre of them. The analysis of the pits, um, it was difficult to say exactly what they were for, but the, fine, the, the fines were a small number of flints and the soil samples showed that the area was um, open uh, woodland with birch and uh, hazel, uh, heather and things like that. Uh, but in the soil samples, they found elevated levels of, of various things like copper, lead and silver, um, which um, would have come from somewhere like the Pass of Balter, about 40 kilometres away. Um, and they were brought to the site and um, deposited in the pits. Now, what they were doing with those, we're not sure, but I always like to show this picture. And I wonder if, you know, colours were very important. You know, there would have been a, a lots of browns and greys and, and greens, but they were maybe trying to create colours with these um, these um, minerals, uh, but we don't really know for certain. And it's possible that the site looks something like this. This is um, a reconstruction drawing done by Jan Dunbar. Now, was it a ceremonial site? Did they put posts up uh, in within the pits, um, which people flocked to do ceremonies? Were they a more practical purpose, like um, uh, for animal trapping, for example, large pits to... Uh, and for animals to be herded and fall into, um, or whether the most the earliest calendar. I mean, we're not really sure. The excavators certainly felt there was more a ceremonial purpose to them than a practical one, just from the from the excavation itself. Uh, but a wonderful site um, that was excavated. So I'm going to pass over to Sheila now to do a little bit on the project itself. Hi. Against this background, in 2016-2017, the Mesolithic D-side was formed, and the main catalyst for this was Caroline Whitman jones who at that time was writing up James Kensworthy's uh, excavations from the 1970s. Um, she was also collating all the previous research at that time, and we wanted to take this forward, uh, but because uh, the soil in Scotland is so acidic, we are very unlikely to find anything organic. But what we do find are stones, and that's what Mesolithic Deeside um, really specialises in, stones. Um, from, the, from 1906, uh, a lady called Hilda Patterson uh, had discovered along at Berkwood, which is on the south side of the D near Bangley, what she described as pygmy flints. In 1906, she was advised that uh, they could not possibly be pygmy flints because the, the conditions were too harsh for people to have survived in the Mesolithic period in Scotland. But she was convinced. And it, but it took her 30 years before this article here was published in the Proceedings of the Society, uh, by which time she'd engaged with Mr. Lassell and uh, had done a small excavation, and he um, gave the authority that it was definitely Mesolithic. So then things went into uh, abeyance, uh, but in the 1970s, in the next slide we'll see, Dr. Grieve came to live at Bankery, uh, at Carathas actually, and uh, he was a retired biochemist. And during the winters in the 1970s, he walked along the fields and the banks of the Dee, and these, these uh, bags show what he found at that time. He had masses of flints, um, which were uncategorized and, and hadn't really been looked at since the 1970s until. 
probably about two years ago when they were uh, looked at by Torben Ballen uh, as part of Caroline Wickham-Jones' uh, recouping of what was happening at, at Nether Mills. Um, he found these scatters were from uh, at Nether Mills, but he also went down the Dee and towards uh, uh, Park, Park Estate, Park Bridge, down to Mary Cooter, to Mary Cooter Bridge, and then further west to um, Inch Marlow, where he also found lots and lots and lots of flints. Um, and then James Kenworthy's excavation happened. And then a lady in the 1990s uh, did some work on field, work, field walking called Jane Kenny. But the next biggest input was during, from 2008 to 2012, when Nestars did field, concentrated field walking at Nether Mills. So when we got together, uh, the next slide shows our preparation. What we need to do is find out the fields and establish, based on previous research, where we might find other areas of, of lithics. So part of my job within uh, Mesolithic DC is to try to find likely fields, fields that have been ploughed, uh, which is uh, because that's the only place we can actually see the flints on, unless sometimes stubble. Uh, then to find out who the who the owner is and who the tenant may be, and then to get permissions for that. Uh, and one of the other things to do, because it's a group usually between fifteen and twenty people, we um, have to find safe parking and safe access to the fields. However, we eventually get into the field and we follow uh, a strategic way of uh, covering the whole field. As you can see down in the bottom right hand, we, we start in a line about two metres apart and we work methodically across the field, trying to cover as much of the area as we can. There's also a weather element of this uh, because the weather conditions do have to be good for field walking. Uh, th they can be wet, but we need to be able to see the the flints in the field. So um, there needs to be a, a break between ploughing and field walking. So these are the tools of the trade that we have. We have we don't need much actually. We need the GPSs which we've built up a, a, a small collection of. Sometimes people use them on the phone, but it's not quite so accurate, the GPS app on the phone. We need some plastic bags, uh, which must have the white label on the one side. <clears throat> That's for the reason that we use uh, Sharpies to write on the coordinates of the find spot on each bag, and it be on the, the proper side of the bag, because these bags have one side you can write on with the white bit, and one side that it just rubs off. So we get a row if we do the, um, if we write it on the wrong side of the bag. Um, so some people though develop their own style and they have um, little clipboards to write on because they're quite hard to open up these little bags when it's freezing cold and, and windy. Uh, other people use bum bags to carry all their, their tools in or little handbags, um, but we all have our own way. But the main reason is for, for when we get trying to get into the fields. The fields in the next slide show our difficulty of um, the sometimes getting a group of people who are um, the demographic would tend to be older. <laughs> and so um, that's not always easy to get over decks. Uh, and, and in the bottom left hand picture, you can see that we, go out, we do go out in all weathers. Um, when I said it had to be weathered, it meant that the, the field actually had to be weathered so you could have to see the stones and the, the dirt had been washed off the, the, the stones by the rain or snow or frost. Frost is actually very good for showing up the flints, but it's a bit of a job to try and get any finds out of it. And we've, we have 
uh, seeing people with little pickaxes picking away uh, at flints that are don't want to to be lifted from the soil. Uh, they, one of the things to remember, as you'll see here at the at the, at the in the bottom left hand one, maybe Ali would be able to take the pointer over. The important part of the field is the end rig. Because sometimes you come to that bit and people think they're there, but the end rigs can be really important for finding things. I don't know why that is, but they are. Uh, and we always have to remember to do that. Then the next uh, slide shows why we do it. Look at these smiling, smiling faces. They're just so pleased with themselves. <laughs> so we are. Uh, when, when, um, when we actually find flints, we're quite competitive. We'll shout, oh, I've got a nice one here. Or, oh, oh. <laughs> look what I got. Um, but, but more than that, people are learning uh, because everybody in this, this slide here, including myself, we're quite novice at um, trying to identify different uh, types of lithic. And so we're all on a learning curve and we, uh, we learn from each other. And that is, that is good. Um, and people have come to love the, well, I don't know how would you call it, but the actual flip. Um, becomes a medium that people really fall in love with and, and they like looking at the different shapes and the different colours uh, and learning more about them, but mainly thinking, oh goodness, is that uh, 8,000 years ago since somebody last touched this or somebody made this? For, what were they making it for? So, uh, and, and they tickle, when you hear two or three flints in a wee bag, a nice musical sound as well. They have a tinkle to them. Um, so what we're left with after this is I love bags. Now, what are we going to do with this? Because some fields, well, we're quite lucky in that most, every field bar one has half flint in it or something, but some have hundreds in. And so you're left with this mess of flints that have um, Different flints, different fine spots, and for each lithic has the yes reading on it, and the date and the field code, and so um, the next um, slide shows you what happens next with this because we have people in our group. Uh, who will do the next bit, which is to make an Excel sheet listing all the finds and their find spot. And very often people will start now putting a description of blade or core uh, on that as we learn, learn more about it. But then the next bit of magic happens when the Excel sheet is passed to Erwin Ross, who is our mapping micro. And he waves his magic wand in his computer and takes vines, which are in this uh, occasion are from Concarden and Neil. Uh, these are Concarden and Neil 2, which you can see is this middle field of the three that have the uh, distribution in them. And this gives us a clear picture of where the the de most dense distribution areas are within fields. As you can see in this one, it's it's more dense in the most eastward field and getting less dense coming over. But what we don't know is what is underneath in Cardinal. At this point, I'm going to hand you back to Ali, who will take you through more of our mapping. So this is just um, an image showing, for example, what fields this year, only in 2020, we have walked around the Crathers, uh, Balbridey and um, Dramoke area. So this is just to show you in one year, the sort of areas that, that we cover. Um, and we were working on other maps showing all of the fields that, we've, that we have walked, but you can still see that there's an awful lot of fields that we haven't walked. And um, we'll be working on that over the next few years, we hope. So then once that's all done and we've got a plot showing where the um, flints came from, 
we work with Anne Clark. So this is Anne Clark, who's our um, lithics expert. This is actually Heather Sadness, who sort of started off the nether mills process really with James Kenworthy, and she was, a, you know, um, very involved in the 70s, 80s, 90s, um, collecting flints on the indie side. But we then start to look at the flint itself and tell us what, see what it can tell us about the um, the sites themselves. So for a start off, where does the flint come from? And most of the flint that we find in Deeside, we think it comes from either the coast, so from below, below, bottom of the North Sea, it gets washed up on the beaches uh, and is collected there. But it's not large pieces of flint. And so the flint that probably we get in larger pieces in the Dee uh, comes from around the um, Buck and Gravel Ridges, which is the Den of Bodom and Skelmuir. You can actually go and look at these um, flint mines here uh, at Bodom. These are an excavation which took place uh, in the 1980s, and you can see that they are digging out um, these old flint mines. Now, we think these data from the Neolithic, not from the Mesolithic. But if you walk around the site, there is there are nodules of flint all around the site. And we think probably in the Mesolithic, they came to this area and collected flint and then carried it around, um, maybe breaking off bigger pieces um, and keeping the nice pieces of, of, of flint. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do on that. I know Sheila thinks, for example, that there is a source uh, on the D somewhere, but we, we don't know. We don't know how to find that out. We have looked, haven't we, Sheila? Yes, we have. Uh, I'm still of the view that um, given the the density level in some areas in D site, that I would love to find some source on the D. Well, we will keep looking, definitely. Um, we do find other materials as well, so it's not just flint, but we find things like rhyolite, um, which Gordon Noble has found at the chest of Dee and probably comes from up in, in that area, up in right high up in the Dee itself. Um, there's sandstones and quartz and agates, um, and all of these we're looking for distinctive patterns of breakage that would tell us that it was a tool uh, and not obviously just a natural flint. So Anne Clark identifies all these. And she also tries to say whether it's Mesolithic or Neolithic or Bronze Age. Um, and this is done by typology, so the shape and style of the, the lithics themselves. Very excitingly, we're starting to get some um, late Upper Paleolithic flints in the area. So we've had some from our field walking. Uh, this is one from, from the Nether Mills site at Crathis. Uh, but we've also had other ones from other sites. So I have excavated a Black Dog and a Peterhead but also um, at the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route site at um, Mary Cooter Bridge, they found a large area where there's a lot of late Upper, upper Paleolithic finds, which um, would take you back to around about 12,500 BC. Um, and it's unlikely that people were living here permanently then. We don't find enough to suggest that, but uh, this is very exciting, um, sort of very new research into this very early period of the D. Um, and this is just to show you that at um, the East Park site, so this is the park bridge here, um, that we found, um, I think, about a dozen uh, Upper Paleolithic tools altogether. And this is just a plan showing where they came from within the field. And this is very exciting to see a little group here. Um, again, at the moment, we're not sure if that's actually significant, um, but we're going to do a bit more work on this um, field and um, hopefully find out a bit more about where the, these Upper Paleolithic tools came from. The, um, the Mesolithic finds that we, we, we get from field walking, a lot of them are called cores, and they're essentially the waste from um, some napping or striking off um, flints from here. And so you can see this where the flint has been napped and small flakes and blades have been taken off. And then this piece of flint has been discarded and you can see the same on this side. And that would suggest that um, the there was a lot of raw material that they're throwing away these big pieces of flint that um, they could have probably taken more uh, blades and tools off, but, uh, but didn't and then discarded them obviously um, for us to find. And one of the main things we find are blades and blade blanks and you can see some here. So these are sharp now, um, and that's thousands of years later. But you can see very distinctive shapes of blades, um, which again, Anne categorizes, and she's able to date for us and tell us a bit more about. 
Interestingly, some of them have notches on them. You can see here in the bottom right. Um, whoops, there's a notch here. And quite often we'll see notches on our blades. And you can see here another group with notches on. But also serrated, sorry, this is not a great photograph. It's very close up of a tiny little flint. But you can see a serration there. Um, obviously, use these blades used for cutting and uh, everything that um, a Mesolithic person needed to do cutting up animals. And we found scrapers, um, and these are a sort of a roundish often um, with one side which has been um, sort of napped or sharpened to allow you to hold it in your hand and scrape things like um, animal skins, you know, hides for preparation for clothing and for shelter. And again, they can be dated. And so once we've collected all these finds and we've categorised, and that's really just the first stage um, of a several stage process. And the next stage would be then to go and um, dig small test pits, um, an excavation at a site with um, a lot of known flints. So we did an excavation of these test pits at East Park. And this is, again, the site I just showed you where we had the upper Paleolithic uh, tools coming from here. And we excavated these test pits. Um, all volunteers um, with um, me directing the excavation and we found really interesting data from this. The test pits which were near the river, so you can see here the river just behind this um, volunteer, that the, the soil was very very deep, over a metre deep in some places and um, we were not sure exactly what that was telling us. Some of the pits were very much shallower and you can see here we had um, schools coming and helping us and Lots of families and children came to help us with the excavation. You can see uh, this one certainly at the bottom, much, much, much shallower. Um, but what we found about these deeper pits was that we were able to, with the help um, of Tim Kinnaird here from um, St Andrews University, he did a dating which um, involves putting a black tarpaulin over the test pit and then cleaning a section and taking samples. And it allows him to do dating based on the last time those uh, the, well, the quartz within the soil has been exposed to light. Um, and he, so this is showing you the samples that he took down. Uh, and this is Robert Brown, one of our volunteers, who did all the analysis on the site that day. And what we found was that this modern soil um, has actually got this older soil underneath it, which would, you would expect. And then there's actually slightly more recent soil a part way down the profile. And so we think that the depth of the soil is explained partly by soil washing down the slope down towards the river uh, and also probably taking lithics with it so that there isn't just um, a profile of modern soil getting older but actually there's more there's more of a variety and so not only do we have to look at um, where we find the flints originally but where they were sorry where we find them now but where they were originally so um, we need to look at um, soil and how it builds up and where it's moved to um, and this is something that we do with um, Richard Tipping from the University of Stirling, Tim Kinnaird um, from St Andrews, and also other specialists, um, Caroline Wickham-Jones, Bruce Mann and various others. Um, we also did some um, test pitting at, this is Nether, the Nether Mill site, and this is one of the, certainly the biggest scatter of Mesolithic flints in Scotland, probably in Britain, I don't know about the world, but you can see that it runs right along several kilometres right along the river here in this wonderful bend. Um, this is the field we call NM4, where we've had huge numbers of flints collected over a number of years. And with the University of Aberdeen and Gordon Noble, um, who took these drone photographs during the dig, we did a test pitting and each of these little piles here is one of our test pits. And we did a random scatter over with, um, well, about 100 volunteers altogether. And we were looking for features in situ, so hearths, postals, anything that might help us to date and understand the site. Unfortunately, what we did find was that it was very, very disturbed by ploughing and animals. So here you've got rig and furrow, medieval ridge and furrow cultivation. You've got modern plough marks here um, and you've got animal burrows. And they were did, had done a huge amount of damage to the underlying sounds. We did find a small number of features, uh, including these old water channels. So these are called paleo channels here. And we took little sections through them. And um, this material from these, um, these features has gone off for dating. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the dates back for those yet, but 
um, we'll certainly um, let people know when we do that and see if we've actually got some Mesolithic dates within these um, pits. So this next stage is very, very important to us to try and find out more about the people who were living um, in the around the D at this time. Uh, and this is just to show you, this is the Google Google Earth. We use Google Earth for finding uh, sites and for all sorts of reconnaissance, but you can see these wonderful uh, images. If you have a look on Google Earth, you'll see these paleo channels actually show often on the, the modern um, aerial photographs. So I'm going to pass over back to Sheila again. Yeah, well, what do we do with all this information that we gather? Uh, it's important information, so it's important for the historic environment record. So everything that we do is reported back to Aberdeenshire uh, Archaeology Service, where Bruce Mann is very much a supporter of our project. Um, but it's also important for the local community because it's part of their heritage that we are rediscovering. And people become incredibly interested in uh, what we're doing when, once they find out uh, why we're walking fields. And, and we, to this end, we, took, we had a temporary display in the Bankery Museum. And the, this slide shows um, what, what we had on display. But actually putting up the display, we discovered a lot more about our volunteers, because our volunteers are from very different walks of life. And we actually discovered that we had a, a window dresser uh, in our company, which was really useful for setting up the exhibition at uh, the museum. We also uh, managed to use some child labour to creep into the windows to set up the, um, the, some of the displays. And we had our problems with blue tack and sunshine, but however, we managed to overcome them. Um, so, and this actually produced quite a lot of interest. And the, so the next stage of this was that we took a stand on the next slide at uh, the Bankery Show. And this was in 2018, which was the worst day ever for the Bankery Show because it bucketed rain. And here we are looking like the rooket rats. Uh, but we had a very good day in spite of that. Uh, we found that we have a, a, someone else in our group who's a, a straw artist and she uh, demonstrated making string and rope from nettles. And then we also had a, 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 an experiment with making a fish trap, uh, which uh, worked quite well. And people could join in this because it was very difficult in the rain. In actual fact, we didn't realise there was a competition going on. And we won the, the award for the best trade stand. And here we are, our rosette and quake, which we now have in our, our uh, group's assets. Anyway, it was a good year. Um, but the next year, we went on to a Boyne show, Boyne Games. And there, the weather was totally different. And we reckon that we spoke to about 200 people that day. Um, and we were able to put up a, a bigger display we did the nettle string again, the fish, the fish traps, but we also uh, were able to let people actually handle flints and get close up views of them. Uh, and that was very, very useful um, for spreading the, the, the information back to the community. In 2017-18, the next slide shows that we were um, able to have uh, training sessions for our volunteers. And here's a group of volunteers, I think at Crathers Hall, and this is Anne Clark in the foreground, going through the different uh, classification of the flints that we find. And if this was early days, so most of us uh, were just at the beginning of learning about uh, the diff what is a blade, what is a core, how do we know whether it's Mesolithic, whether it's Neolithic? Um, and on the right hand, we have not only are we interested in the small lithics, but this we think is a stone tool. And you can see down the side of it that there there's some sort of markings on it as if it's been used or shaped for something. So it's 
sometimes um, we're looking not just for the tiny stones, but for the big ones as well that are part of the story. During uh, 2018 as well, uh, we were able to invite James Dilly uh, up from down south somewhere, and he did us a demonstration of flint napping in Crathers Hall car park, where we laid down to pollen so that the sharp little flints wouldn't get into the, the, the tires of the car afterwards. Anyway, it was very, it was very useful, and, and he made it look so easy. <laughs> but for the next slide shows, well, he did. That shows uh, one of our volunteers having a go. And a lovely thing that one of our volunteers was able to actually uh, make. Um, he did have to help us a wee bit, but uh, he did that very gracefully and um, graciously, I should say. And uh, we all enjoyed it as an experience. And it showed us that it was it's very skillful. Um, so then I think that's me finished my part of this and I'll hand you back to Ali. Yeah, I mean, just before the end of the talk, I wanted to show this lovely uh, image, which was produced by the Forest Commission Scotland uh, for um, in the Wildwoods uh, education pack about the Mesolithic for taking kids out into the uh, forest and uh, doing various activities with them. But this just shows some of the uh, things which might have gone on in a Mesolithic camp and why they needed these sharp blades and scrapers. Um, they would have obviously been catching and utilising bits of all the animals. Um, and of course, along the Dee, specifically the fish, which is why they were along the Dee, because there would be enormous salmon at that time. But this is just a lovely image, I think, showing um, you know, the different uses of the tools that we you can see all the family getting involved here. Um, you know, everybody would be involved, the kids, males, females, everybody would be involved. Um, and just to sort of finish up, um, we're going to carry on field walking. Um, the season's January to April, as Fila mentioned earlier, the fields have got to be ploughed. So that's really our season. We're going to try and carry on um, fundraising for doing more test pitting um, and looking at things like, you know, is there a local flint source? Can we... Um, you know, can we find that? Um, we've had a look along the river and it's 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 difficult to, you know, to um, to see that. But there are various research issues as well that we're going to be uh, following up on for the next um, few years, we hope. And so just at the end, the most important bit, of course, is that we have had funding from various places, uh, but also support, not necessarily funding, but support from places like the University of Stirling, the University of St Andrews, the University of Aberdeen, and um, as Sheila mentioned, great support from Bruce Mann at Aberdeenshire Council Archaeology Service. So we're going to sign off there and um, we'll keep people updated with our projects through our social media on Facebook and um, on Twitter. And uh, if you want to get in touch with us, um, have a look there and um, drop us a line. So thank you very much for listening and uh, thank you, Sheila. OK, bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>